effort. We're just giving everyone a few seconds to join me, and then we will we'll begin. All right, I think um, we're ready to begin our webinar today. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Wendy Xu. I'm the Director of Product Management at Guardian Analytics. My colleague Sally Pawar and I will be your hosts for today's session on digital and then payment behavioral customer segmentation with Fraud Analytics. Sally, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, Wendy. Hi, everyone. I'm Sally Pawar. I work as a product manager here at Guardian Analytics. All right. Thank you, Sally. Housekeeping announcement. Uh, today's session is being recorded. You will receive a URL link notification if you want to watch the session later or share it with your colleagues. The presentation slides are available in the attachment. Uh, there are also public source URL links that we will be referring to at the end of the webinar. Please make sure you have just one BrightTalk browser session open. Otherwise, you may hear some echo. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, there's a question box where you can type them. We will address them either live or by email afterwards. Please rate the webinar and suggest content so we can improve. And finally, let me quickly read the safe harbor statement. So the following is intended to outline our general product direction. It is intended for information purpose only and may not be incorporated into any contract. It is not a commitment to deliver any material, code, or functionality, and it should not be relied upon in making purchasing decisions. The development, release, and the timing of any features or functionality described for Guardian Analytics products remain at the sole discretion of Guardian Analytics. So for the benefit of the audience uh, that are not familiar with Guardian Analytics, uh, we're a member of the Federal Reserve's Fraud Detection Work Group. Uh, we're selected as one of the few fraud detection technology providers. Um, a few words about what Guardian Analytics do. Uh, we detect fraud risks using machine learning and the behavioral analytics. Our technology allows our fraud detection system to self-learn individual users' behavior, uh, monitoring user events in real time detect anomalous user activities. Um, the algorithm we use allow us to adapt to new threats uh, without relying on rules. Before we deep dive into fraud detection analytics and its capabilities, I'd like to give everyone a quick overview of Guardian Analytics fraud detection platform. So at the bottom, as you can see, we have an enterprise API layer that allow us to ingest data from digital banking and payment platforms in real time. On top of the API layer sits our multi-channel risk engine that process the data and evaluate fraud risks. Then we have the application UI that supports the fraud operation team's workflow from alert monitoring to disposition to case management. And then finally, for today's topic, the fraud detection analytics all the user and transaction events and attributes with their enriched risk information are made available um, to meet the customer's analytical needs. So you may be most interested in knowing what's inside of fraud detection analytics and what kind of a data are made available for it. Um, Guardian Analytics use multi-dimensional risk model for detection. The algorithm learns about users' device pattern, location pattern, uh, account activity pattern, and many more. Um, these behavioral dimensions are used to build a complete profile of the user. And within each of these dimensions, there are hundreds of data attributes that are collected for fraud evaluation. And all these behavioral data are made available for fraud detection analytics. What we believe that makes behavioral-based fraud analytics unique uh, is that it allows financial institutions to segment their data or end customers with behavior and risk insights. 
compared to non-behavioral-based customer segmentation, behavioral-based segmentation has four key advantages. Number one, it derives insights from what a customer does instead of who they are, and this enables DFI to address very specific customer needs. And then number two, it provides much richer data about the customer. It allows the FSI to create more granular segments based on customer's device usage, banking feature usage, uh, that traditional non-behavioral-based segmentation uh, could not afford. And the third thing is it allows CFI to target specific segments based on historical and predicted behavior with the right risk mitigation strategy. Non-behavioral-based segmentation is often very broad, and then that leads to overly generalize a risk strategy that affects more customer than necessary. And then lastly, the overly generalized risk mitigation can increase the friction for digital banking and payment experience. The increase of friction is often at the cost of customer loyalty. And on the other hand, with a targeted risk mitigation, the friction are only increased for specific segments or even just the individuals within that segment for their specific risk exposure uh, based on their behaviors. So you might be wondering what kind of a practical use for fraud detection analytics. And the first thing that you come to your mind it might just be, you know, it's analysis of the fraud pattern. Uh, but it actually goes just beyond that. Like I mentioned, it allows you to segment your customer by their behaviors and the risk profiles. It helps you understand where the risk exposure is, and you can take the appropriate action to mitigate the risk. Uh, it supports the fraud operation team to monitor their workload and the productivity. And lastly, even though this may not be on top of mind for fraud operation team, fraud detection analytics can bring very important insights about the customer and then contribute to your customer 360-degree view if your institution is trying to understand holistically who the customer are and what do they do. So let's take a look at a few examples of customer segmentation. One way you may segment a customer is by looking at their average risk rating and their transaction behavior. Um, and you may be either delighted or surprised to find out that maybe your high-risk customer segments are not the ones that transact with the highest amount. Right? These segments are derived from how much they transact and what is the associated risk are dynamic and adaptive as your customer's behavior evolves over time. And from the segmentation, you can drill down into different level of details and get a deep understanding of the risk exposed at each segment in order to prioritize your risk management actions. So once you're segment your customer, and you may be interesting, interested in exploring and answer some of the questions, such as what kind of a banking activity each segment engage, uh, how much do they transact, how do they actually transact, what channel they, they use, and then where is the fraud risk, uh, how much fraud or cost, and how do you mitigate and prevent those from, from reoccurring. And you may break down the data by the banking channel or payment method, um, and then by number of fraud uh, that's observed, and then compare it with historical trends to get an idea of you know, whether something is creeping up or decreasing, and how, how does that trigger your shift of your process uh, around it. And as I mentioned earlier, fraud analytics can really help fraud operation to understand how the team works and their productivity. Uh, many of the fraud operation team may use reporting to demonstrate their value add uh, or justify resource investment. The most direct impact of using fraud detection analytics is to quantify the fraud team's value by measuring and illustrating fraud prevented and or fraud losses. Right, the action taken by the fraud team for reviewing and dispositioning the alert, uh, as well as opening or closing uh, cases, provide the data 
for fraud detection analytics to analyze the team's productivity and the workload balance. So by knowing who did what and how much was done, uh, there's always opportunity for the fraud team to improve their process and increase efficiency. The last point I mentioned earlier regarding the usage of fraud detection analytics, um, it's about contributing to a customer's 360-degree view. But how, how, how does that relate uh, to the fraud operation team? Um, as a banking user engage activities on various digital and payment channels, with behavior and the risk analysis, you not only can understand what channel has the highest user engagement, but also able to monitor uh, whether the money flow in uh, or out of the user account is net positive. So in other words, you can um, discover if the user is accumulating assets at your institution. And then when thinking about building customer relationships, fraud operation may not necessarily be the top of mind for many people. Uh, however, we believe this is actually a very important and large part of the value they add to uh, the business at the FI. That's in addition to preventing fraud losses. So using fraud detection analytics to understand customer behavior and that there are associated risk, this can help an FI to identify the right conversation to have with the customer and therefore making positive impact on building customer satisfaction and the loyalty uh, over time. So I have talked a lot about fraud detection analytics and I went through some of the examples uh, what it can accomplish. I think it's time that we actually see it in action. So Sally will give us a live demo of customer data exploration using fraud detection analytics. Sally, let me pass the control over to you. Thanks, Wendy. So this sample dashboard is to showcase customer segments by behavior and associated risk. We have seen this scatter plot previously um, in the presentation where Wendy talked about how lower transaction amount shows higher associated risk. To understand the risk associated with these segments, let's look at transaction details by channel. These bar charts show that the customer from high risk segments have higher P2P transactions associated. Uh, this financial institution that we're looking at has recently launched P2P service and we can see that P2P might be a high risk area since the transaction volume is high. Now, let's look at how fraudsters are targeting different channels. This pie chart on the left gives us a view of confirmed fraud by channel in current quarter. We can see that digital channel has 54% confirmed fraud, which is highest of all channels. Also, we can get a deep dive into this insight by looking at last few quarters worth of data for confirmed fraud. We can see digital channel is always been on the higher side and it is increasing every quarter, whereas wire fraud is decreasing and ACH fraud is around the same. Um, as we just observed, digital channel is experiencing the largest number of frauds compared to wire or ACH channel. Let's look at what is causing these frauds in digital channel. How is money moving in and out of customer's account? What are the digital channel platforms most popular among fraudsters? Let's look at P2P, online wire, bill pay, and external transfer details. We can see P2P showing highest fraud at 60%. So what is causing P2P fraud? We can also look further to understand how these fraudsters are targeting P2P channels. This next chart shows 60% of the attacks are happening as account takeover, 20% of the attacks are due to malware, and 20% is social engineering fraud. This insight here provides a direction for financial institution to prioritize their effort to mitigate the risk. Another way to look at 
the behavioral and user activity data is in this next bar chart at the bottom. This chart explains how many wire frauds occurred when customer had set up a wire approval process on their account. This is a good insight from customer activity that 91% of the wire frauds occurred for customers that did not have a wire approval set up. It is clear from this chart that if financial institution is enabling their customers to set up additional barriers from these fraudsters, the effort is helpful. So these are some of the scenarios where behavioral and risk level fraud analytics is really useful. Behavior based uh, fraud detection analytics can help validate your assumptions about the customer segment or it may reveal new insights about new fraud trends. Both these ways, uh, behavior-based fraud analytics is designed to help financial institutions make informed decisions on their risk mitigation strategy. Um, that's all I, I have for the demo. Uh, Bendy, do you want to take over? Sure, thank you, Sally. Um, these examples are like a very common scenario uh, that that may encounter at an FI, and then really depending on how the FI may want to define your, you know, what it mean by high risk, what it mean by medium risk, and what angle they want to look at their customers' data, uh, these, you know, different slides and dice of the data can reveal different kind of insights. So in closing, I want to reemphasize that using behavior and risk profiles to segment customers has a numerous advantages over traditional non-behavioral based segmentation. Um, the richness of the insight derived from what the customer does, uh, where he does it, and how he does it adds tremendous value to your risk mitigation strategy and customer engagement strategy. And this is exactly the value um, of Guardian Analytics fraud detection platform can bring to our customers. Um, so with that, this is the end of presentation. Um, I'd like to now open up for the audience uh, for Q&A. Okay, so let's see if there's any questions from the, the chat box. So it looks like there is just a few that are coming in. Okay, um, all right, so the first one, the first question is how do we access fraud analytics can these charts be customized, or can we build our own charts? Sally, do you want to take this one? Sure, Wendy. Um, so fraud analytics data is shared as a CSV file, um, and the file contains all the attributes associated with device pattern, location pattern, account activity, as well as transaction pattern. Since it has all the elements that you need uh, for the analytics work, you can build your own charts, slice and dice the data as per your own financial institution requirement. Okay, thank you, Sally. All right. So the next question um, is, can we segment the customers using other attributes instead of the average risk score? Sally, you want to take this one as well? Sure. Um, so today we saw how we can use risk-based segments to understand the data and act on a, a mitigation strategy for the risk. The risk profiles can definitely be segmented in several different ways, um, such as uh, transaction pattern um, and understand how user activity is associated with the fraud by segmenting customers using transaction pattern. Okay, and then there's a very similar one uh, with the previous question, and it reads, how can I identi identify customers' risk profiles through their online banking behavior? Um, so the, uh, like Sally mentioned, the fraud analytics provides um, a whole set of different attributes uh, that the customer can use in slice and dice, and these attributes uh, include confirmed fraud, the risk factor identified when the fraud is detected, 
um, the uh, channels on which this fraud occurs, and then you know activities from the user, payment method, etc. So the combination of these attributes can be used uh, to build this risk profile. And then, like I also I, or mentioned earlier, that it, that the flexibility is with the FI to define uh, what it means to you by risk. Some may be just by counting how many fraud occurred on a particular channel over a period of time, or it might be you know by the uh, the amount that it pre prevented or the loss. Um, so depending on how you want to categorize the risk, you can use different kind of attributes to segment the customer. And then in relation to the banking behaviors, the activity will reflect what the user what the user actually does uh, does on the platform, such as typically logging during Monday in the morning or Thursday in the evening, um, always go through MSA successfully, always go to account view first, always have a approval process when there is an online wire initiated, et cetera. So these can also be associated with the you know the fraud knowledge or the fraud data collected um, to build you know what what it means for a, a high risk customer based on what they do, uh, what do they do uh, in a particular banking channel. Um, and the last question is uh, a very straightforward question. I uh, asked so what is um, what kind of BI tool does fraud analytics work with? Does it work with Power BI? Um, so the uh, like Sally mentioned, the data uh, from fraud analytics are shared in CSV file format uh, with CFI, so they have direct access to the data. And then, as long as the you know the BI tool can consume uh, CSV uh, file imports, then um, it can be supported. So Power BI definitely has that capability, so it can be imported into Power BI, and then you can use Power BI to uh, blend your data with uh, other sources or slice and dice it, you know, creating different kind of reporting as they wish. Okay, um, I think that's all the questions that uh, we have. Um, and if you have any additional questions uh, from this webinar, uh, webinar, please feel free to contact us. Um, the email uh, is shared on the screen, success at guardianalytics.com. And then we have additional uh, resources uh, on Brett Talk, other webinars that's been published before, uh, and then product videos on YouTube, uh, and then follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. And with that, uh, this concludes our webinar today. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you again in future webinars.